Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming out here tonight. I know it's a little chilly, lovely, but we have so much to talk about because, you know, when you talk about lies, it's always exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so many lies to talk about. So I want to dive right into this. And um, this started because I've been treating patients for almost 30 years. And we say, okay, you've had a heart attack, now let's do X, Y, and Z. And they still come back with more problems because the residual risk is still 70 to 80%. So if I told you you still have a 70% chance of having a heart attack, would you be happy? No. <laughs> but we all were happy with that, that we're doing everything possible. I've taken care of A, B, C, D. But that's just not enough if the residual risk is so high. So where did we get the comfort from? We got the comfort from statistics that I'm doing everything. And I've reduced your risk by so much and so much and so much. And today I'm going to show you some of the lies that we have propagated or have been propagated. So if your residual risk is still very high, you've got to do something about that. And today I will talk a little bit about statistics and how statistics can lie. And I will show you a new paradigm, a paradigm that's going to be based on real knowledge. Okay. So Galen Foundation, by the way, Galen was involved in prevention years and years ago, of course, in the time of the Roman Empire. And he was the physician to Marcus Aurelius. And he was the one who coined the term doctor, which means to teach. So he would teach people how to get better and how to get healthy. And he had already talked about diabetes in those days. Years ago, he talked about diabetes. All that time ago, he was, a, he was an amazing, amazing physician. Oh, can you hear me now better? Oh, good. All right, I can just relax now. Uh, really, really good. OK, so I don't need to be labor on that. So <clears throat> we've been living with the lipid hypothesis that cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. Everybody agreed? That's what you heard, right? Yeah. Yes, OK. And it causes coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, and peripheral vascular disease. No good. And this data I need to tell you about, that in 1957, this doctor stated that in order for patients to lose weight, they must be on a high protein, high fat, and low cholesterol diet. All the way back in 1957, he was already saying that. And in 1961, multiple studies already showed that if you eat a high carbohydrate diet, you get lipemia within one hour. And yet that was the time that we all jumped onto this fat bandwagon. So if I take your blood sample, I give you lots of fat. I, let's say I give you three eggs to eat right now. And then I take your blood sample one hour later, and then I give this young gentleman over here, let's say, yeah, yeah, he's young, he's young. And let's say I give him a real high carbohydrate meal right now. And I check your blood. Whose blood is going to look fatty and all, you know, cloudy because there's fat in it? It's going to be the guy with the high carbohydrate diet, not the guy who just had the high fat diet. We knew about this back in 1961, yet I bet you each and every one of you in this room thinks that because you ate the egg, his blood should be looking all cloudy and mucky. So that brings us to Ansel Keys. He said, look, the only sure way to control cholesterol is to reduce fat in the U.S. diet from 40% to 15% of total calories and to cut down saturated fats from 17% to 4% of the total calories. He also went on to say that Americans eat too much fat and much of that saturated fat damages the arteries and leads to coronary artery disease. So who was Ansel Keys? Ansel Keys was appointed by the U.S. government to come up with the key rations. The key rations were the rations that the soldiers used when they were in the war, that these are the rations. This is what, and he was the one who 
for some strange reason was given that job. And what was his qualification? Well, he was a BA in economics and he was a PhD in fish physiology. <laughs> Yet, he was appointed by the US government to give advice on how we should feed our, feed our forces. And then he comes up with this theory. So he comes up with this diet heart hypothesis, which is the Ansel theory that stated that dietary saturated fats increase cholesterol in the blood and in turn increases the risk of coronary artery disease. He came up with that. So there was a perfect storm brewing around this time. There was an increasing incidence of coronary artery disease and people said, we need to find a cause for this. And Ansel Keys came along and says, I'm going to study this. And he came up with the six country study where they correlated dietary fat to death rates. And look at the curve he, 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 he got. OK, do I have a marker here? Do I have a marker? Mm. Well, if you look at the first curve, it goes straight up. The more calories from fat, the higher the incidence of CHD. CHD means coronary heart disease. But the graph on the right was the real graph. Those were all the countries that were included in that list. And what he did, he only selected out the six that he knew fell into that graph and presented the data. This is called cheating. <laughs> he deliberately threw out the data from the other countries. And as a result, he was able to come up with this. And at that time, everyone was so bamboozled by him that nobody questioned this. That, wait a second, what about the other data? You missed it. And yet, he was able to publish this, and everybody said, oh yeah, there's a correlation between fat intake and heart disease. So then he came up with the seven country study, and again, showed a correlation between dietary fat and increased coronary heart disease, but again, he missed all the data. He handpicked the countries, only included men and not even women, because if he included the women, it would skew the data. And he only showed a small percentage of what they were actually eating. Basically, he cheated. And nobody stood up to, stood up to him. There were a lot of physicians that did stand up to him, a lot of scientists, but he was a bully. And he bullied everybody, including international scientists. <coughs> So over the years, we've questioned his conclusions. And we look at the study from 2017, which is the pure study which just came out. And this is a more up-to-date study of what you're eating and what heart disease you can get. And this study, just published two years ago, looked at over 100,000 men and women in 18 countries. And all 18 countries were included in the follow-up. And the conclusion was there was no association between coronary heart disease and mortality or the intake of saturated fats and overall fat intake. None. Quite to the contrary, patients who ate more fat, especially saturated fat, had lower incidence of strokes. They did better. The more fat you eat, the better you are. And the higher carbohydrate intake, the sugar intake, because remember, by, 19, by 2017, we were all on that low-fat, high-carb bandwagon. So the higher carbohydrate intake was associated with an increased mortality. Because when you don't have fat to eat, you're going to eat carbohydrates. We stopped eating fats, we started eating carbohydrates. So. Since Ansel Keys, there have been several randomized control studies that have actually disproved Ansel Keys hypothesis and clearly showed that dietary fat was not linked to heart disease. But still, people didn't like the results. Why? Because they needed something to explain why people were having heart attacks. But excuse me, people were smoking. In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, people were smoking, and they were smoking a lot. But nobody thought about smoking as a cause. And in fact, actually, there was. It took 50 years to finally get people to understand that smoking causes heart disease. And finally, the government then stepped in and also started doing something about it and promoting um, advertisements, et cetera, to make people quit smoking. It took 50 years. You mean we just woke up overnight and said smoking is bad? No, we knew about it. We knew that smoking was bad. 
but it's very hard in medicine. Look, something new happens in, on, on, uh, in technology. Let's say the Apple or some other new device comes up with some new way to make something better. Immediately it's implemented, everyone knows about it. Somehow in medicine, we have an inertia that takes years and years and years for people to start believing and turning the, the Titanic. You just cannot turn the medical Titanic. And that's exactly what happened. So they needed something to believe in. And the fat hypothesis still continued. Because other people stepped into it. Trials ran for more than 10 years. Reduced fat intake to about 20% and saturated fat down to 70% uh, to 7%. Results, no improvement in heart disease. Major failure, because it didn't align with people's opinion. People already made up their mind, because all the advertisements were out there. So now, let me talk a little bit about fats. Well, actually, before I talk about that, there was a perfect storm brewing up at the, around this time. In place of saturated fats, people said, well, what should we be eating? Well. The government said eat polyunsaturated fats, promote that. And people were already eating a lot of margarine instead of saturated fats. Margarine is even worse than polyunsaturated fats. Margarine is so terrible. At the same time this was going on, nobody still made a big deal about smoking in the 1960s. A lot of smoking was still going on. So the disease process still continued. We continued to see more and more heart disease. So let me come back to the types of fats now. We have saturated fats, which are found in meat, poultry, coconut, tropical oils, lard, tallow, and butter. We have monounsaturated fats that are found in nuts and olive oil. Polyunsaturated fats, now watch the word, manufactured vegetable oils. Soybean oil, peanut oil, safflower seed oil, sunflower seed oil, cotton seed oil, canola oil is also in that. These are manufactured. There's no natural oils like that. So, and then there's trans fats, which are found in margarines, baked products, chips, and reheated vegetable oils. So the polyunsaturated fats, what's the history on that? That history actually started a very long time ago. At the turn of the century, the cotton industry had all these seeds left over after they took the cotton. So what are we gonna do with these seeds, man? So somebody said, well, we have tons of them. Let's crush it and take out this black oil that comes out of it. it smells terrible, but it's beautiful oil. It's oil. So let's use it. So what did they use it? They sold it to the Ford Motor Company. <laughs> oil your engines and parts and pop. That's what it was for. And then they still had a lot left over. So they said, we need to do something about this. And then a company called Procter & Gamble took it. And they said, well, we've got to make this thing digestible so people can eat it. Let's just feed it to people. Take it out of the cars and put it in people. So they took the color out. They added a nice yellow color. They processed the heck out of it. To get things out of it, they used solvents, which are petrochemical things. All the vegetable oils that you all are consuming have been treated with solvents petrochemicals, et cetera, et cetera, to make them what they are today. They're extremely processed. If you saw the processing plants, you wouldn't ever consume those vegetable oils. They're manufactured. Just remember, they're manufactured. And how many times have I told you before, if it's got a barcode on it, don't eat it. <laughs> told you that many times. So what's changed? <clears throat> People still continue to smoke. Vegetable oils entered the market. Because you should stay away from meat, stay away from saturated fats. Well, of course, the food industry was very happy to step in with vegetable oils. And sure enough, they did. And they have no cholesterol in it. So they got the stamp of approval from the American Heart Association. These are vegetable oils are very healthy for you. Stamp of approval. Cholesterol free, you still see it. You still see the vegetable oils, the mazola and all that. Cholesterol free, the nice heart next to it, all that nice stuff. What it means is it's gonna kill your heart. <laughs> and then, 
So let me give that history. In 1911, Procter and Gamble, I told you about Crisco. Oh my God, Crisco, short name. And they made books on how to cook with Crisco. So it was used for candles, wax, and lubrication. Candles, you want to eat? Go home and eat your candles, folks. <laughs> this is how serious this problem is because someone's going to make a buck on it. Think about this. Think about how angry I got when I started reading all this stuff. That just to make some bucks here and there, people do these things. So now let's go back to some history. Who indoctrinated Ansel Keys? He read studies like this. He took rabbits and he gave them animal fats, lots of it. And then they got atherosclerosis. The poor rabbits, their arteries clogged up. But remember, they're vegetarians. Rabbits don't eat meat. But they gave them meat. And then they cut their hearts open and said, look, this, look, look, all the cholesterol is in there. Wrong. So let's move forward. So the journey to increased carbohydrate intake. So they said, okay, we can't eat fat. So now we're going to eat more carbs. Because that's all you got left. You got proteins and carbs. So the food pyramid comes out. People start saying, what should we be eating? Because of that fat lie. So now you come to the Framingham Heart Study. In that study, which started in 1948 and is still ongoing, they found that patients with increased cholesterol initially had coronary artery disease. They found that in 1948. But when they did a follow-up study on those patients, those with the highest cholesterol actually lived the longest. And I'll show you the data. In 1953, the American Heart Association promoted corn oil, margarine, chicken, cold cereals to replace all saturated fats. They said, go from red, red meat to white meat. Come on, who hasn't heard that? Change from red meat to white meat. This all started in the 1950s. Corn oil, margarine. Then in 1953 also, the six country study came out where he handpicked the studies. The seven country study came out in the 1970s. So these were the data that we based this on. And then comes the 1977 McGovern report. What is the McGovern report? Well, now the government said, hey, look, people are just dropping like flies. They're dying of heart attacks. We need to do something about this. So they set up a commission It was led by McGovern. On data that I just presented to you, they came up with the food pyramid. They said, that's it. We have now a war on saturated fats. We need to make it official American policy. No more saturated fats in our diets. We need to promote more healthy diet with more carbs instead. <coughs> In 1980, now, a lot of people were offended in 1977, saying that, look, you have inadequate data to make this recommendation that we need to cut down fats. But they still proceeded, went forward. The USDA then followed and said, hey, we need to do this too. And they came up with their recommendations that, hey, we need to cut out all fats and go up on carbohydrates. The food pyramids of 1992, look at that. Remember that every so many years, the new food pyramid comes out. Encourage the propagation of fat as bad and cholesterol and uh, carbohydrates as good. And in 2010, the dietary guidelines of all these organizations said that fat intake should be less than 70% of your daily calorie intake. So there's a massive increase in your carbohydrate intake that occurred in the last 15 years. Massive increase. And throughout all this time, what happened to heart disease? Went higher and higher and higher and higher. So today, we consume 35% less fats. What happened to coronary artery disease? Went up. So all this advice that was given was totally wrong. All lies. So look what's happened with this diet that we have now propagated. The diet of the, of, the, of the pyramid and the United States USDA recommendations. Look what's happened. The percentage of population who has a body mass index greater than 30. United States, 31. Just go down that list. 
Japan is only 3%, Korea is only 3%, because they didn't adopt our dietary recommendations. All the countries that took on our dietary recommendations had massive increases in their weights. So carbs make you gain weight. There's no doubt about it. When you have a cow that's going to go to the slaughterhouse, do you start giving it lots of fat? No. What do the farmers feed it? Corn. Carbohydrates. That's what makes them gain all the weight. It is not the fat that the cows get. No. They all get corn. And remember that a, a gram of, 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 of sugar is only four calories per gram. The proteins are also four. Fats are nine. Give the cow fat, but no, we give them corn instead, and they gain more weight. So what about this Mediterranean diet? Everyone's, who likes a Mediterranean diet? Everyone puts their hands up. Of course, there you go, there you go. Whose idea was it? Ansel Keys. 1959, oh, oh, somebody said, thank you for saying, oh, oh. <laughs> so what he found is that 40% of the Cretan diet was from fat, and yet the mortality was low. He couldn't understand this. In, in, on the island of Crete, they had so much fat, and yet the mortality was really low. So he postulated that this has to be from fish and from olive oil. So he pushed the idea that, ah, polyunsaturated fats are found in olive oil, and fish also have omega-3, so he said, this is the diet that these people should be eating. But what he didn't realize is that the people on Crete were very poor, actually. They were pretty poor people. But they all ate fresh vegetables, lots of it. And they had lots of protein. And they did eat fats, saturated fats, not just polyunsaturated fats. So he made this up. And he came up with the Mediterranean diet in 1959. There is no correlation between heart disease and the percentage of calories that come from saturated fat. This came from a huge study that was done by the British Journal of Nutrition in 2012. And the percentage of saturated fat in the French is greater than 40% saturated fat, and yet they have a much, much lower incidence of heart disease than the United States, where we have less saturated fat because we are good. We listen to the government. The French have greater than 40% calories, of which 15% is saturated fats. Then we call this the, oh, this is just the French paradox. When we don't understand something, what do you call it? A paradox. That means, basically, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so let's talk about meat intake. Very, very poor epidemiological studies. Okay, so if you take meat eaters, all these people like to eat meat. These people, they have less meat intake. But then if you look at it, yes, they're going to have more heart disease. But the meat eaters also, they found, smoke more. They exercise less. They eat less vegetables, right? And they are much higher carbohydrates. And besides the meat, they also eat a lot of processed meats. So how do you know that the small increase, a modest increase in the total mortality in cardiovascular disease in meat eaters is due to that, due to the meat, or was it because of their lifestyle? So when you have multiple variables, how do you know which variable is responsible for that minor increase in the mortality? Is it the meat intake? Is it the saturated fats in it? Or is it all the other things that meat eaters are associated with? In the Dean Ornish study, they took patients and they said, oh yeah, look, these patients are doing great. It's because of meat and saturated fat. It's not, because in the Dean Ornish study, they all had to become vegetarians. And they all had to quit smoking. And they all had to also decrease their sugar intake, and they all had to also exercise. So how do you know that the final result was because they cut down on their fat and meat intake, or was it from all the other things? So when you have multiple variables, you, you really you cannot make any conclusions. So let's look at some prospective studies now. In 1948, the Framingham study I told you already started. And William Costelli, who was the director, 
He stated that there's no correlation between fat intake and coronary heart disease. Now, a prospective study is much more accurate than a retrospective study because it's actually looking at events as they occur. In 1957, the Chicago Western Electric Center, no correlation between dietary fat and cholesterol levels. None. In 1971, the Honolulu Heart Study showed that a low-carb diet decreased coronary heart disease, and there was no correlation between fat and coronary heart disease. None, none whatsoever. These are huge studies where they took tens or hundreds of thousands of people and followed them. In 1999, the University of California study also showed low-fat diets caused patients to change the lipid profiles from pattern A to pattern B, which is the bad pattern, which is small, dense particles. And a high-fat diet actually made the pattern B go to pattern A, which is the better pattern of your fats. The saturated fats did that. 2001, the type of fat had no effect on heart disease. 2007, the Swiss study. In children, fructose found in all your juices and low-fat diets promoted by everybody produced pattern B hyperlipidemia. And we know that that's atherogenic. Why didn't anyone say anything about this? 2010, the Queensland study showed a 16-year follow-up study that full-fat milk consumption actually resulted in 60% less heart attacks. Full-fat milk. 2012, the US and the Germany study showed that dairy fat causes a decrease in your heart disease and type 2 diabetes as well. 2017, the British Journal of Sports Medicine, saturated fat does not clog arteries. Coronary heart disease is a chronic inflammatory condition, and the risk can be reduced by a healthy lifestyle intervention. Multiple prospective studies. The data is overwhelming. But we have our head stuck in the sand, and we have our heels stuck. We don't want to budge. What's it going to take? So we need corrective thinking. Rabbits are herbivores. That study goes out. Dogs that were given saturated fats, because dogs eat fats and they eat meat, they don't get coronary heart disease. These days, dogs may get heart attacks because you're giving them human food, which has followed the US recommendations. Six and seven country studies were deliberately omitted. They're all wrong. The remote tribes of Maasai, the Arctic Inuits, and the Aboriginal tribes of Australia consume 60% dietary fat, mostly saturated. And guess what? They have the lowest incidence of coronary artery disease on planet Earth. Breast milk. The poor child is born. And he's already feeding on 54% saturated fat. Saturated fat, that's in mother's milk. 54% saturated fat in mother's milk. Yet, if you look at today's feeds that we give babies and milk that we, we, we make artificial milk, it doesn't have saturated fat in it. Excuse me, you're trying to give the baby something that, that mimics mother's milk. Then put 54% saturated fat in it because it took two and a half million years to come to that point. Evolution's done the job for us. They've done all the research for us. But no, we know better. Let's look at that history. The Paleolithic era, two and a half million years. Homo sapiens came about 200,000 years ago. It took that many years to make our genome, that this is the physiology you're going to have. It took that long. We were hunter-gatherer men. We ate fatty animal parts, a few seeds and roots, fruits, bulbs, and grains, and legumes, and corn. Very little, but we ate mostly animal parts and some fruits and vegetables. Then came the agricultural era 10,000 years ago. We increased our carbohydrate intake. Not massively, but we did. And what happened to man? He started getting dental caries, all the data show. Man became shorter and fatter. Then came the Industrial Age, which only started 250 years ago. And with it, we boosted our carbohydrate intake even more, more sugar. Sugar, 
plain, simple sugar. Sugar came about now, why? Why? Because sugar actually came from Borneo. And then went slowly up towards China, then the Far East, and then finally came to India. So from 8,000 years ago, about 2,000 years ago, it came to India. When it came to India, there was some smart guy. He was not a computer guy, but some smart guy in India who discovered how to take molasses, which went bad, and he made crystals out of it. Once he made crystals out of it, now you could keep it forever. And you can transport it. So in a short period of time, it went straight from India to the Middle East, to the Persian Empire. From there, it went into the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, all that stuff, and then went into Europe. And before you knew it, the whole world was hooked on sugar. And then, because you can't grow sugar in Europe, they said, well, now we need new land. And they went out and discovered new land where sugar can be grown, and hence all the colonies and everything. It all comes down to sugar. The college was not sought because we just wanted new land. The real incentive was sugar. <laughs> now today, sugar also comes from beet. So what was the story behind beet? The story is very interesting, because what happened is that right after World, uh, around World War, just after World War I, Europe did not want to rely on some of the other allies to get sugar, because they had the, they had the, 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 the the Far East or the West Indies, and they had places that the colonies. So, so Germany did not want to rely on some of its allies. So he said, well, we got to find a way to make sugar grow here in the cold climate of Europe. Well, how are you going to grow sugar in Europe? Well, the Germans were very innovative. So the scientists went to work, and they came out with a way to make sugar out of beet. So today, almost 50% of our sugar comes from beet, I think, around that figure. So it was discovered in Europe by the German scientists. So there you go, they suddenly had sugar as well. Hence, sugar intake went even higher. And also, I told you that vegetable oils came on the market just at the right time when Ansel Keys said, stay away from saturated fats. And bingo, you have an explosion now of carbohydrate intake and decreased fat intake. Let's talk about cholesterol and mortality. Remember I told you in the Framingham study, initially they found that and then they followed it for 30 years. What's the conclusion? The Framingham is one of the most robust studies in medicine. They showed that there's 11% increased mortality for each 1% drop in your cholesterol. And there was no increased mortality with the high cholesterol patients. And this was published in JAMA. This is very frightening, guys. So why was the McGovern report passed? Because they felt compelled to do something. And guess who had a heart attack? Eisenhower. Look, he had a heart attack. But everyone forgot that he was a chain smoker. He used to smoke at least three packets of cigarettes from what I understand. The 2005 European cardiovascular statistics also showed an inverse relationship between cholesterol and cardiovascular. It's the opposite. The higher the cholesterol, the better they seem to do. So we, we're running into this problem over and over again. More and more studies. No significant evidence of concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with increased heart disease. Massive study. No relationships of fats to myocardial infarction. The Leon Diet Heart Study. This was a great study. Mediterranean diet versus a low saturated fat Western diet. Low saturated fat Western diet, which is what we have adopted now, right? Versus Mediterranean. Showed an increased risk in the low saturated fat diet. Also, cholesterol did not change at all in the Mediterranean group. So where was the benefit? If the benefit was from cholesterol lowering, it didn't change. The higher cholesterol patients actually had better survival, and the low-fat diet did not protect against coronary artery disease. So people who spoke up to all this risked chastising by their colleagues, 
if funding may be withdrawn from them because it goes contrary to what we've been taught for all these years. And therefore, in the past 100 years, we have seen a 535% increase in fish oil intake, a 1,150% increase in the sugar intake, 83% decreased saturated fat intake, 200% increase in a chicken intake, and a 30% decrease in red meat intake, and yet coronary artery disease is going up and up and up and up and up. It tells you a story. Unless there's something else that's causing us to have heart disease here, right? And there is. There are other things that are causing it. And that's where we need to concentrate. On. What, what is it that's making us have heart disease? It's not that. It's not the saturated fat. It's not that. Let's look at some more data. Majority of the patients who have a heart attack, they don't have a high LDL. I'm sure you've heard this one before. They don't. What they do have is a low HDL, and they have a high triglyceride. Now, look at the graph, the, 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 the table on the right-hand side. Looks a little crazy, but, but watch. The first one says low-fat diet. The next one says Mediterranean diet. The next one says low-carb diet. Look at the CRP, which is your C-reactive protein. Those on a low-fat diet, the CRPs went down by 0.6. Those on a Mediterranean diet, it went down by 0.9. Those on a low-carb diet went down by 1.3. They were on low-carb, moderate fat, moderate protein. All they did is cut down on the carbs. Triglycerides went down by 2.8 in the low-fat diet. Only 2.8. Well, wait a second. If you're on a low-fat diet, your triglycerides should have come down a hell of a lot. But no, it doesn't. It only came down 2.8. 2.8. The Mediterranean group came down by 21. But look at the low-carb diet. It came down by 23. The triglycerides came down by 23. Look at HDL. In a low-fat diet, it went up by 6.3. Mediterranean went up by 6.4. went up by 8.4 on a low-carb diet, your HDL. Because they have more fat in their diet. And then look at your LDL. Your LDLs went down by 0.5, 5.6, and 3 only. So LDL is a very poor predictor, actually, of myocardial infarctions. What's predictive of myocardial infarctions is actually the ratio of your HDL to triglycerides. That is what predicts heart disease. It's the HDL and triglycerides. So let's move on. Not LDL. The workplace diet study. Okay. Also, I want you to notice something else here. In E, it says fasting insulin. And if you look at non-diabetic patients, most patients are non-diabetic, right? And I want you to notice what happens to the fasting insulin levels when you are on a low-carbohydrate diet. Your insulin levels plummet. They go all the way down, minus 3.7. Insulin and sugar is where the action is. It's all about insulin and sugar. That's what's driving heart disease. And of course, that's a topic for a different talk where I can show you much more data. It's all about the sugar. It's all about your insulin, not fats. So what about drug therapy for color? So wait a second. So Doc is saying that, OK, if it's not the fats in the diet, then if we lower our body's fat, cholesterol, with diet, uh, I mean with drugs, surely there'll be a decrease in heart disease, right? That's why we have statins and drugs. So let's look at drugs now. Let's look at drugs. Because if that theory is right, then drugs should have a fantastic effect. Because you give cholesterol-lowering drugs, you should see a profound effect on heart disease. Am I right? If that theory is correct. All right, so let's look at the drugs. Primary prevention studies with statins, number needed to treat, NNT. I want you all to know what NNT means, number needed to treat. That means I'm going to treat 100 people here with this drug for, let's say, five years. Number needed to treat. How many of these 100 people will be saved from getting a heart attack? That's the NNT. So if the NNT is 90, that means 90 of them will not have a heart attack. That's phenomenal. But on the other hand, if if only one life is saved, that's pathetic, right? 
So NNT, number needed to treat, is the flip of that, which tells you, let's take this one. Primary prevention statins, 104 to 300. That means in the studies, there's anywhere between 100 and 300 patients that you need to treat for five years with statins to prevent one heart attack. Look at that number. And by the way, 21 of those, 100, will have muscle aches and pains and 24 will develop diabetes during that time. Let's look at secondary prevention for statins. Number needed to treat is 83 for mortality, 39 for non-fatal myocardial infarction, 125 for CVA prevention, but number needed to harm is 50. That means that, means that one out of 50 patients will develop diabetes and one out of 10 will get muscle aches and pains. So you, you say, okay, you know what? You've had a heart attack. I want you to take a statin. And don't get me wrong, I prescribe statins. Take the statin. And then you're gonna to say to me, but doc, what's the benefit? And I'm gonna say, well, there's a, you know, if I give the same statin to 83 of you guys, similar people like you, I'm gonna save one life if you take it for five years. It's not much of a number there. And I'll show you more about this in a minute. So how did we get so crazy about LDL? It's because of statistics like this one. It's all statistics. The Mr. Fit Prospective Study showed that the, usual, the cholesterol level, which is at the bottom, the higher the level, notice the dots go higher and higher. The relative risk of heart disease goes higher and higher and higher. Oh my God, for every little bit increase in my cholesterol, I'm getting a higher, higher risk of heart disease, right? Right, that's what that graph shows, right? But I want you to look at the vertical column and say relative risk of heart disease, 0.5, 1, 2, relative risk. That means if compared to those who didn't take the drug, you had a 0.5% increased risk. 0.5% increased risk. That's not much of an increased risk. So yes, there is an increased risk, but it's minute. It's not what it's made out to be. But when you put it on a graph like that, that graph makes it look so amazing. It's all about statistics. This slide is a little bit out of order. It should have been a little bit earlier. But I want you to see something on this slide here. It's a very busy slide. So I'm just gonna say a few things here. The orange bars are people who are eating a lot of cereals. Low glycemic is the blue, low glycemic also the purple, and then the, the other reddish color is a low carbohydrate diet. So the last one is the carbohydrate diet in each group. So let's look at the weight. Who had the lowest weight reduction? Those on a low carb diet. Who had the lowering of the hemoglobin A1C? Those on a lowest carb, low carb diet. Glucose, low carb diet. Total cholesterol, low carb diet. But also some in the low glycemic index diet. LDL slightly went up when you're on a low cholesterol diet. Therefore, everyone blamed LDL. Oh, LDL's bad. That's crazy. And HDL, look at the HDL on the low carb diet. Off, went up. And look at triglycerides, came all the way down. And what did I tell you about the HDL and the triglycerides? That they are the most predictive of heart disease. So the very parameters that are gonna predict your heart attack risk are best improved with a low carbohydrate diet. Not the fat, not the fat. All right, so that previous slide I showed you about LDL. If your LDL is less than 150, you're gonna have a 99.7% survival. Your death rate is gonna be 0.3. But if your LDL is more than 290, you have a 1.3% risk of heart disease, but your survival still is 98.7. What is the difference if your LDL is 290 versus 150 in terms of survival? The absolute risk difference is only 1%. 99.7 versus 98.7%. So therefore, 
The highest level of cholesterol causes a 1.3 divided by 0.3, which is a 4.1, which means a greater than 400% increased risk of heart disease. Now, um, I'm going to take a pause here. How did this come about? What they're saying is that if your LDL was greater than 290, you have a 400% increased risk of heart disease. How did they come up with that? They came up with that because they said if it's less than 150, your death rate is 0.3. But if you have a cholesterol greater than 290, it's 1.3. That's 1%. But that's 1% absolute risk. But your relative compared to the other group on placebo, it's 1.3, it's 4.1, that's 400% increased risk. That relative risk. This is falsifying of statistics. Relative risk doesn't give you actual risk because your actual risk is still very low. So if your LDL is greater than 290, your actual risk is 1.3. But compared to the guy with the LDL of 150 who has a 0.3, there's a difference of 400%. Did you get that? It's statistics. All right. Let's talk about... Um, Okay, I think I already talked about the Honolulu study, so I'm going to move on. This was another study that showed there was, there's an inverse relationship between LDL and mortality in elderly people. Now, this is a very important study. I wanted to show you this because this is a 2016 study that high LDL is inversely related to mortality in people over 60. People over 60 need a higher cholesterol level. They actually live longer and they do much better. And that's what the study showed. So about these drugs, let's come back to the drugs. So what did Ansel Keys do? He said, cholesterol is a problem. So I'm going to give people corn oil and see what happens to the cholesterol. And sure enough, people who took corn oil, two tablespoons a day, hmm, versus those who had regular diet, what happened to their cholesterol? So go to the bottom to the results, and you'll see corn oil diet. What happened to the cholesterol? It went down from 260 to 225. That's fantastic. So Ansel Keys is right, right? But when they looked at three years survival, the corn oil group, only 50% were still alive, and the usual diet, which is 75% of them were alive. So the cholesterol lowering did not correlate to any mortality improvement. It just made the number look better. So it's true. Polyunsaturated fats will lower your cholesterol level, but you'll die sooner. <laughs> and this has been shown over and over and over again. So lower your cholesterol nicely through that, and you'll die faster. <laughs> Let's look at the uh, lipid research clinics. Here what they did, this is what started the statin frenzy. We take cholestyramine. Cholestyramine binds cholesterol, lowers your cholesterol. They gave it to patients, and they found that 24% reduction in heart disease rate. Heart disease went down by 24%. Total mortality, no change. No change. So, okay, son, you won't get a heart attack, but you'll die of something else real fast. And that guy who's not taking any cholestyramine, right? Okay, he's not going to get. Uh, he's actually going to live the same time as you. What's the point? So the study urged pharmaceutical companies find a drug that will lower your cholesterol level. But there was no change in mortality. So where did this 24% reduced heart disease come from? Flawed data. Look at this study. This was the ASCOT LLA study. This is a very nice study. And now, this is a beautiful study, actually. The, the, let me show you this. This is what came out of it. In patients with multiple risk factors for heart disease, this is a true advertisement, by the way. Lipid 2 reduces risk of heart attack by 36%. Hell, you all should be on it. <laughs> I would. 36% reduction in my, come on, are you crazy not to take this drug? Doc, are you crazy not to take this drug? So how did they come up with 36%? And I want to show you how they came up with 36%. And this should make you pretty angry. So the event-free survival was 98% in atovastatin. statin. Event-free. That means nothing wrong. They, they survived it. The placebo group, who did not take the drug, only 97% of them 
had an event-free survival. So there was a difference, definitely. The difference was 1.1%. So whether you all took the drug, this group did not take the drug. The difference after the trial, which you've got to take, take it for many years. This one has actually stopped after two and a half or something around three years. The difference in these two groups was 1.1%. That's it. So now let's churn this to see how you come up with 36%. So what this is, is the absolute risk difference was 1.1%. Now let's work out the relative risk. I told you how to work that out. The relative risk is the difference divided by the risk that was in the placebo group. So it's 1.1. The placebo group had 97% survival, so the death rate was 3%. So you divide it by 3. So it's 1.1 divided by 3 equals 36%. So they worked it out that there's a 36% reduction. When in reality, this graph should look like, this picture should, Lipitor reduces risk in heart attack by... 1.1%. Well, that's not going to sell your drug. <laughs> Absolute risk reduction was 1.1. So what is the number needed to treat? If you have multiple heart risk factors and you took that drug, your NNT was 91. That means 91 patients have to be taking that drug for three years or four years to save one event. So what am I saying here, that do these drugs not work? No, of course they work. There is efficacy to it. They do work. But they don't work as well as you think they do. The statistics augment the benefit. And it is a play of statistics that makes it look that way. And I've been wondering about this because I'm going to say, if I'm that good, my patients shouldn't be getting heart attacks. Especially if I've already put a stent in them and fixed them and uh, you're coming to see me, come on. You shouldn't be getting out of it. But they do. Because we're missing things. Because we, we, we put too much importance on the pharmaceutical effects only. But the biggest bang you're going to get in healthcare is not this. It's your diet. The biggest bang you're going to get if you want to reduce your risk is diet. And that diet is not fat because that's full of lies. It's all to do with insulin and carbohydrates, which is a different talk. And I'll show you the evidence for that. Just like how today I'm showing you the evidence here with, with the falsification of fats and drug, drug effects. Look at the Jupiter study. This was a huge study that came out using rosuvastatin. Event-free survival, 98%. If you didn't take the drug, you didn't live very long. You only had a 97.2% survival. Difference, 1.2. Let's do the math. 44% relative risk reduction. Absolute risk reduction, only 1.2. NNT, 83. You all become very good statisticians now, aren't you? But you're seeing now how you can make statistics say what you want it to say when it comes to relative risk. And when you play the graph out the way you do, you, you look at that graph. I want you to see the first graph. Rosuvastatin so low, placebo so high. But then when you look at the vertical column, it's 0 0.02, 0 0.01, you magnify that. Now look at the, uh, the, the bigger graph, which is the, the, the wider one. Cumulative incidents at the top and the years that go by, four years, five years. Do you see the two groups kind of separating out at the bottom? <coughs> Hardly any separation. There is a separation. I don't deny it. There is separation. But don't think that that is going to give you a great advantage in life. There is a benefit. But it's not as big as you think it is. There it is again. Look at that. 44% difference is reflected in that little area right there. So you go back to all the way to five years and you look at the cumulative incidence if you didn't take the drug. It's still very, very low. So let's talk about the side effects of some of the statins. A lot of lies here as well. Your testosterone levels go down because this cholesterol is a mother molecule 
that makes testosterone, it makes hormones, it makes a lot of things in your body, and your brain is full of cholesterol too. Weight by weight, there's a lot of cholesterol in your brain, you need it. So two and a half million years of evolution gave you all that cholesterol and created a system in your body only to kill you now. <laughs> so the statins. <clears throat> Statin use increases the risk of kidney disease. Eight and a half year follow-up study, clearly documented. Statins and musculoskeletal conditions. Yes, already been well documented. Erectile dysfunction. Type 2 diabetes. This is the one that bothers me, type 2 diabetes, because the NNT4 or NNH number needed to harm is between 15 and 25, which means I give it to 25 people, I've harmed one person who's going to develop insulin resistance or diabetes. And you know that that's not a good diagnosis. So 11 randomized controlled trials showed no evidence of any all-cause mortality in high-risk primary prevention studies. So there's no survival data, none, none whatsoever. There's not a single study there that showed improved survival. And the reason I'm saying this is, you know, let's get out of this misplaced comfort that we've made, done over the years on pharmaceutical interventions and blind faith in what has been taught to us by the USDA, by the food pyramid, and by the food industry. Because the food industry is very happy to come up with a new concoction. Well, how about just eating real food? Real food. Forget the industry. We just want real food as it comes. If it looked like the way God made it, then eat it. You know, that type of food. But that doesn't make money for the food industry, see? This is the, this is the NNT for diabetes in the Jupiter study. No, sorry, no, not, the, not the Jupiter study. This was in another study. Um, and it was one, it was 15, which is very alarming, very high. These were the initial studies that showed that these medicines do have side effects. So if it's the lies about the fat, it's the lies about the efficacy of drug management. And these drugs don't reduce your mortality. Therefore, because they, they ill-founded, fats are not the problem. The bad fats are your polyunsaturated fats. They're made from seeds. But you don't even need to think further because they're manufactured. If it's manufactured, it's got a barcode on it, don't eat it. <laughs> it's manufactured, it's made in a factory, don't eat it. We need to reevaluate our fundamental foods. We need to go back. At the turn of the century, we were eating a lot more fat. There was hardly any coronary artery disease at the turn of the century. At the turn of the century, it was unheard of. There were only 500 cardiologists in 1920-something. There were only 500 cardiologists in the United States. Heart disease was literally unheard of. We started going higher and higher and higher because of our lifestyle from smoking, taking in polyunsaturated fats, and our, our love affair with carbohydrates. <coughs> carbohydrates are your problem. And my next talk is going to be on the bittersweet truth, which is different from fat lies. The bittersweet truth is going to be all about carbohydrates. And, and and it's going to talk about how that is what's causing our problem. The lipid abnormalities that we are now detecting in everybody, we couldn't explain them, are explained by abnormal carbohydrate metabolism. It's the high insulin levels. And I'm just going to leave you with a teaser on that. Because what happens is when you're, by the time your sugar levels are up, and your hemoglobin A1C is up, you're already doomed. You're already going to have heart disease because it started 10 years ago when your sugar levels and your A1Cs were under perfect control at the expense of high insulin levels. So I'm going to say that one more time because this is the, the crux of that. For about 10 years, 
before you become a diabetic, your insulin levels were very high and could have been detected and you could have acted upon it. But you didn't because nobody knew about it. And your insulin level being so high, your glucose was able to be maintained normal. And your A1C is fantastic. You go to the doctor, the A1C is fantastic, you're great. But nobody measured your insulin levels. And your insulin level being so high causes atherosclerosis. It causes, uh, explains the, all the lipid abnormalities that we're seeing. So what I've done now is, you know, after having done this research, I'm measuring insulin levels. So you drink a bunch of sugar water and measure your insulin level. And your insulin level, if it's high after drinking sugar water, even though your sugar is normal, you have hyperinsulinemia. You have insulin resistance. When you start treating a patient at that level, now that's preventive medicine. Now you will prevent that patient from becoming a full-blown diabetic in the future and with it cardiovascular disease. And I will show you how, what the benefits are. I already alluded to this on my last talk when I talked a little bit about fasting and what that does to insulin levels and how that improves insulin resistance. Um, but it does come back to carbs, but I'll show you real hardcore data that's going to be amazing for you all. That it is all to do with carbs. It's all to do with sugars that we take in. Stop consuming sugars. Stop giving your children poisons, which is the sugars. Stop giving them excessive amounts of fructose as well. Remember, fructose was supposed to be consumed right before hibernation so that you put on a lot of fat so you can go into hibernation. Today, we consume fruits and fructose, but we never hibernate. So it never comes. We eat it throughout the whole year. And I think at one of my talks, I did say that cut back on your fruits. And people looked at me like, you're crazy? Cutting down fruits are good for you. Fruits are not that good for you. You should eat some fruit. But you eat some. That means half a fruit and the whole thing. And stop making a puree out of it and stop juicing it so it all goes into your body all at one time. And the poor pancreas says, what happened? I had an onslaught. I had a, you know, you gave me all the sugar in five seconds. I don't know what to do with this. I'm going to give you all the insulin I got. Throws it all out there. Now you get hyperinsulinemia for the next four to five hours. Job of insulin is to put everything into storage. And then you wonder where the fat, wait, wait a second, why am I getting a gut, a big belly? So if I gave you fat, your fat will go in, will be absorbed, chylomicrons will transport it throughout your body, and then you will start metabolizing it through beta oxidation all over your body. Some will be left over if you ate too much fat, and maybe you put on some fat, but that fat will go everywhere in your body. Now you eat a lot of sugar. Now what happens with that and fructose? goes straight to your liver. Your liver then converts it into fat. That fat will go straight to your belly. So if you want to know who's got a high insulin level, look around. <laughs> if you have a belly, you probably have high insulin levels. So all you need to do for those patients, you can go straight to the diet I'm talking about, or well, I, I'm a scientist, I need a level. Then what you need to do is have breakfast, non-fasting, do a non-fasting insulin. That's the other thing that bothers me about everything we do, everything backwards. If I fast, of course my sugar's gonna be perfect. And of course my insulin levels are gonna be nice and low. I wanna know what my insulin levels and my sugar levels are doing after I eat. Especially since I've been recommended by everybody to eat five times a day and snack in between. It's another piece of nonsense. See? Another huge piece of nonsense. Because of course, two and a half million years ago, I was so good I could make a kill every three hours. I was an expert archer. You know, and I never fasted, of course. Yeah. So I want to know what your sugar level is and what your insulin level is after food, not fasting. 
So you go to your doctor and you get a fasting blood sugar and you've done yourself a lot of good? I mean, this is something to think about. You should not be doing fasting levels. You should be doing postprandial levels if you really want to know where you stand. Because you're going to look great fasting. It's like the guy who drinks a lot and goes to his doctor and do my alcohol level. I haven't had anything to drink all night. I'll prove to you I'm, I'm perfectly sober. No, but I'm, the point is we, everything is backwards. And we are at a great time in medicine because we have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of know-how. We really know we need to now implement it. And we need to get out of old thinking and get into new thinking. If you want to count calories, and by the way, none, did I even mention the word calorie in anything I said here? No, because you shouldn't be counting calories. You want to lose some weight, you want to get better, you want to get rid of that belly, you want to get better, you want to get cholesterol better, not, just look at the type of food. Change your type of food, which is going to change your hormonal condition. Your hormones in your body will change, of which, which is the biggest hormone that you worry about? Insulin. Insulin is the big elephant in the room. It's all about insulin. Insulin will put all your calories that you eat into storage and will prevent the storage banks from releasing also. So you want to release, you've got probably 12,000 maybe more calories stored in your fats, but you can't use it because of insulin. When your insulin levels go down, now you can use it. That's the only way to lose fat, is to lower your insulin levels. So I can talk about that on another talk. So my next talk is going to be about the bittersweet truth. I'm going to talk about that sweet thing called sugar, which has really caused the greatest catastrophe in health on this planet. And we are right in the middle of it right now. It's all about sugar. So I will see you all with the bittersweet truth in eight weeks. All right, thank you.